Hello, hello, hello. How's everyone doing today? Uh, I'm Kevin, and this is Kevin Explains It All. So today I want to talk to you about opening your own local game store, uh, which would be about the gaming community or just your own business in general. Uh, first off, I want to tell you a little about my history. Hey, Kwan, how's it going? Uh, I have owned various businesses for the last 15 years, um, leading from promotion-based businesses where I ran events at nightclubs. I had a photography business. Uh, I worked for campaigns where I actually worked on a U.S. Senate campaign. I worked on a presidential campaign and helped them hey, uh, help them basically uh, run their campaigns. And then from there, I opened a restaurant. Hey, Mike, which was the very first, uh, let's call it brick and mortar business. All my businesses before that were online, essentially. And uh, the restaurant was the first full scale large business that seated over 150 customers. We had 20 employees. It was a massive operation. Myself and another owner went into it together. And I learned a lot of the things that I know today about not only opening your own business, but also opening a local game store from that and from a local game store that my friends owned. Now, uh, the name of that store was Cardboard Horde. A uh, little shout out to those guys um, down Joe and, and uh, uh, oh man, why do I keep forgetting your name? <laughs> anyway, uh, my good friends down in Ocala. And um, <clears throat> they ran the shop like a lot of people. Hey, Michael, how's it going? What's up, Bacon? Uh, I'm Bacon. How's it going? Uh, they ran that shop primarily as a very traditional local game store. And what I mean by that is uh, not only games, it was 95% it was Magic the Gathering. And this was... Uh, let's see, they opened it about eight years ago and it ran for, I think, four years, somewhere around there, maybe three or four years. Now, in a small town with a population of less than 100,000, it was really successful uh, for a while, at least. Uh, that being said, the two owners also still had full time regular jobs and they ran the shop as their part time job. So that kind of tells you when you sink all your assets and money into Magic the Gathering, what the return on investment is. Let's just take a look at some of the figures. An average local game store, and this is there's various tiers, okay? So you, you work you through your distributors, but some of this is known, some of this is maybe not known. An average local game store will buy a brand new box, say a box of corset, right? They'll get a box like this for anywhere between 60 to $70, okay? And that's per box, and they often buy cases and cases. Hey, Chris, how's it going? So when they buy this for between 60 to $70, and then you see people selling it online for 80, you realize there's really a very, very slim mar uh, margin of profit at say $10, right? And these prices, this is what I knew of about six years ago when I was uh, friends with the local game stores. So it's possible these prices have actually gone up a little bit. Now that they've gone away with the MSRP, it's possible they're playing closer to 70, maybe even $80 for the average store. So I don't actually know, I'd have to adjust that. Um, so when they buy a box, like a standard box like this, and they get it, let's say $70, and they sell it for $80 uh, online primarily, you realize they're only making $10 profit. That's not a lot. And maybe guys who are doing it online from their basement can afford those very, very slim margins, but individuals running a local game store that has to pay for electricity, rent, insurance, uh, various fees... And then actually their employees, even themselves, if, if usually a local game store just employs themselves, um, then they can't make it off of a, off a $10 profit. So that's why you'll often see at an LGS boxes of standard going for somewhere around 100 and as high as around 115, 120. And how they break that down is they usually say it's about $4 per pack. So four times 36 packs, you kind of get your numbers there. And, and most stores, many stores, depending on the product, will also do the buy three packs, get them for $10 as opposed to, so you save $2. And they use those configurations as well. And that kind of gives you anywhere that balance between like $115 to $125 or so. So when you're buying these for $70 and then you're selling and your profit is eventually $120, okay, so that's not bad. That's pretty good. Problem is... How long do they have to sink that money into that product? Um, hey, David, how's it going? Sorry, just catching up on stuff. Great, guys. Thanks for the, the chats there. How long does a, an LGS have to sink money into a product like this? Remember, they rarely buy just one box. They're normally buying five, six, dozen, two dozen, three dozen cases of this stuff. So if it's a hot product, sure, it goes off the shelves. They make their money. They're feeling good. But if it has to sit there, it sits there 
for a long time. And eventually that price usually will trickle down, down, down until it gets to a point where they can either sell it uh, and make a little profit, break even, or sometimes like what happened with conspiracy sets in the past, uh, they'll lose money. For those that don't remember, Conspiracy 2 was not popular until recently. Conspiracy Set 2 was selling below MSRP. I saw people sh shipping them out at $65. No one was getting them at $65 brand new, but the set was just not popular for a year plus until finally it got the boom where it's now sitting, I think, 140 150 something like that. So you got to remember there's several costs that go into running an LGS, and this is just talking about sealed product from Wizards, okay? Uh, and that's not including their specialty products. So in the past when they were doing master sets, granted those often sold out, but what rate are you getting them at? For example, uh, this, another store that I was friends with down in Bellevue in Florida, you know, they would get their sets of masters for, say, $180 shipped, right? And then they would adjust the pricing to 220 or so. That's actually less profit margin than you would find on a standard set when you think about it. So it's an interesting dynamic when you sink so much into it. And if the set bombs like Iconic Masters did at one point, you've got guys that are standing wow. with five, six cases of Iconic Masters. They can't sell, and it's just sitting there. And this is money that's tied up that they could use to reinvest in their business. They could use for their, their personal needs or anything. And they can't unlock this, this, uh, these products. So you have to be aware of that just going in. If you base your entire business just on wizards, you will fail. Okay? And it's not me saying I don't like wizards. Wizards provides most of the money that I make here um, between Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. But not really. See, that's the draw that brings people in. How I establish this business. Now, granted... This is just a basement, guys. For those that haven't physically been in this location, this is literally a basement. I live around the corner uh, on the other half of the basement. At some point, I'm looking to transition and gut out the entire downstairs, and we will move upstairs and make it all into a much more uh, professional-looking local game store. But for right now, I kind of sit in what we call the laundry room area, and we've established this as our basement um, game store. But my overhead is next to nothing because I'm already paying for this space. So I, I, my situation, my problems are much different than a, a regular store might be. I don't have the overhead as far as um, having to get suppliers online, get those business licenses. Uh, the insurance is, is set up differently. Because realistically, how I explain this, this is just me having some friends over. This is just my man cave. I, and that's more or less what it is. When people come over and they buy food, they're buying food because they're donating, you know, to to what I'm doing here, that I'm opening this game space to, for people to play in, which New York is also very unique. I'm seeing all the happies and everything else. Hey, guys, New York is also a very unique situation in that unlike in many other cities where there is tons of room for parking, tons of room to go play, tons of room for a lot of things, you don't have that here in New York. In New York, almost every game store in the five boroughs will charge you to go in and play either a minimal five, ten dollars and that's in product or food or snacks or whatever, or just say, hey, it's ten dollars if you want to borrow a game and play for a couple hours, something like that. Just because of how limiting the space is here in New York City. So if you go out to even Long Island or Pennsylvania or Florida, that's not going to be the case. People won't necessarily charge you to go ahead and play. And remember, if they're not, that's money that's not going in your pocket. So you'll have a lot of situations, going back to my friends who were in Florida and they ran their store, they didn't have hot food, they didn't really have a, an expansive food selection, which is where a lot of game stores are turning to make additional profit. They just sold cards, sealed product, buy and sell collections, and they ran small tournaments. So their profit margins were often very, very thin, and they worked their asses off to try to make that money. But... Um, Anyone looking to open their own game store in the future, I think that's a losing profit model. You can't depend on these guys, especially when they take their specialty product like the Mythic Edition and sell it online and screw it up through eBay, or they sell their boxes now on Wizard or on uh, Walmart as well as on, on eBay and Amazon and, and all the other retailers. How can you compete as an LGS? How you compete, in my estimation, it's not just a game store. It's a game store cafe. And that's really where you're seeing the development of all these businesses go in the future. 
Um, there's many, many metrics and trends you can follow as you look through various Forbes magazines and, and people who think they know what the, the trend is. Millennials and people who are younger than millennials, they're not necessarily wanting to go to bars that much anymore. The, the average sports bar is kind of a dying trend. Even uh, Applebee's, those types of places, they're, they're all kind of on the low. What is picking up a lot of steam are cafes. Cafes where you can go, where they can play games, where they can have interactions, where it's not necessarily about a, the pressure and the situation where women may feel uncomfortable um, because they're in a bar where there's drunk guys, you know, the, let's call it the traditional norm of a sports bar kind of situation. Um, a lot of people, <laughs> yeah, and a, a good point, uh, Mike, you mentioned about arena too. I'll get to that in a second. A lot of people actually are, the trend is wanting to go to like a gamer style cafe Great example of one, one of the favorites. I got to travel cross country recently and go to many different gamer cafes. One of my favorites is Mox over in Seattle. That is, if I could make my own perfect establishment, that's what it would be. It was a full scale local game store. It's actually very popular when they, I forgot the name of them, but they're all over online. And you just walk through an entryway and there's a full scale restaurant and bar. And there's no doors in between. You just literally walk through the, the or entry, right? And it's literally, they just said, here's a restaurant bar, full scale. And then here's a giant game store with tables and seats. And you can bring food back and forth. You can bring games back and forth. You can play, you can eat, you can drink, you can have a great time. And they did an excellent job. And anybody wanting to uh, duplicate that kind of success needs to basically bring that forward. Esport is also very big. Mike, you're bringing, you're going to the future. I love it. I love it. That's definitely something we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so local game stores of the future for people wanting to open that and or any business, you have to think about what the trend line is, where the profit is, where the, where the crowds are going to over the next, not only five months, year, but five years, what will people be doing? Now I have a prediction and I've seen a lot of it come true that a lot of people are addicted to their mobile games, right? And they're playing, they're playing, they're playing. And that's a very popular thing to do. But what we're missing in that, when we play stuff like Arena or Hearthstone or a lot of these eSport games, we're missing that, that tactical feel, that, that feel of actual cards, that feel of actual something you own. Now, Magic is kind of unique. I mean, there are other TCGs for sure, but Magic is definitely one of the most established around the world, and it's also the longest going. That not only gives you cards you physically can hold, you can trade with other players, you can sell them, you can invest in them. It's something tangible, and it's something real. It's a reason why I haven't downloaded a single game on my Nintendo. I still buy the cartridges, and there's still people who prefer to have cartridges. One, you can't really trade digital games unless you crack them and do homebrew kind of stuff. You have to, if you want to trade or sell your old game, you need a physical cartridge. Same idea with this. Where I think Arena may have gone wrong is not giving you the option like how Moto did, where you can actually gain some kind of value, some kind of intrinsic cash value, even though it's a minor one, where you can put money into the game and get money out of the game. That's something Paper Magic still has and online magic does not any longer. So that's something to be aware of that there's an intrinsic value to just financially speaking about physical cards that you no longer have on these eSport games. And I know that's all by design, but there's also this desire to have something, a collection, to have something you can say, this is mine. You know, as opposed to going online, I'm huge. You know, how about in my home? I've got a great collection. In this binder, I've got a great collection. In this deck, I've got a great collection. That's something that you can't really duplicate just because you have a screenshot of some cool cards you have in the digital world. It is fun, it is convenient, but there's not the value, if you understand my meaning. So I still think there's a lot of room for gamer style cafes. And why do I keep saying cafe? Because cafe to me says food, it says beverages, it says things you do, they may not be the draw. The draw may not be, oh, I've got food and drinks. The draw is the games. The draw is the act of playing games with people and having a good time, social interaction, not phone interaction, literally talking to people, trying to outthink them, seeing them right there on the spot. That's where I think there's still a tangible future for gamer store cafes. And while you're there, because people, when they play, they play for hours. 
they play for, you know, two, three, ten games later, they get hungry. You know, rule of law, everyone has to eat. Energy has to be created. So those people will spend money on food. The question is, will they spend it at your establishment or will they spend it at the local McDonald's, Wendy's, you name it. So you got to be kind of uh, think about that. I have what I call an asses and seats ratio. I'm sure this is not unique, but it's, you know, that's what I call it. What is the asses and seats ratio when planning out your own business store? When you're running a cafe, a gamer style cafe like this, for me it is how much money can I expect from the average player over an established amount of time? And you can see it like an actual graph. So if a player is there four hours, they'll probably spend X amount of dollars. And this also depends if they come at lunch or dinner time. And if they're there eight or 10 hours, they spend X amount of dollars more because people get hungry. You know, people typically will eat one to three, maybe four or five meals a day, or they'll snack a bunch of times and things like that. Again, they're gonna spend this money on food somewhere, okay? The question is, will it be at your establishment or the guy down the street? So that's where you've gotta create better options for food, you've gotta have better drinks, you've gotta to listen to your customers and try to get them what they want, and you've gotta make it so it's profitable for you too. Here at my store, uh, I run this where I do happen to have product that I sell, and I have cards that I run through consignment, and we run the raffles and box crackings and things of that nature, and of course we have live play here all the time too. And what do you know, I, I sell a lot of uh, these little Funko toys as well too, just because I love them. Um, but those are nice little ancillary things that people buy. I can't depend on them, okay? I can't depend on these getting sold every day. When they do, that's great, that's icing. But what I can depend on is if I've got eight or 10 players here, I can depend on at least half of those players getting hungry at some point if they're here for more than four hours and they're gonna buy some kind of food and if I have layered my profit correctly, then I will profit on that food and I will be able to pay the, you know, continue paying the bills and keeping this place open. So that's just how I've created this local game store. And again, there's a lot more to come here, but the game stores of the future all have to incorporate that model. They will fail. An excellent example, if they don't, uh, an excellent example, a store down in, in Long Island in Linwood, um, they primarily did a lot of Magic the Gathering type uh, events. Magic the Gathering or Wizards pulled their license. I'm not gonna get into the store's name or any reason why, you guys can figure it out. But they pulled their license. Uh, it was a political reason, I'll just say that. And so now they no longer are allowed to sell brand new Wizards products. They can't run their sanctioned events. And that license being pulled cratered their business, cratered. How do I know that? This place picked up about a third of their EDH business. That's how I know. This place went from two pods a, a Sunday to four or five. And a lot of those players came from that location. And that, I will not say if it was right or wrong that Hasbro pulled their license, but being that dependent on their license hurt them significantly. Now granted, they've managed to recoup and they do other things now. They're big into Yu-Gi-Oh, they're big into video games, and I wish them the very best. But you cannot put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to your business. And this is any business that you do. It doesn't matter if you uh, want to run your own uh, lemonade stand. You should have cookies with the lemonade stand. You see my point? Different points of sale, different ideas, so that if one thing goes down, you have several other things that can potentially sell for you and make you money. So any kind of game store, any kind of business is a risk. There's no doubt about it. But things to be aware of are when you're planning your store, you have to know that you have to be able to ask for the sale. And this is an important uh, thing to think about in life. For, for the last four years, I've been pursuing a job or a career as a commercial actor. And I've had middling success, but it's a very difficult career. And, you know, sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. But you learn in this career, one, to be humbled. <laughs> wow, have I been humbled. But two, you learn about the ask. And the ask is a salesman's technique. And this is basically saying, what am I worth? The product that I'm selling, whether it's actual, physical, tangible product, or it's me, what is it intrinsically worth? What do I bring to the table? And it doesn't matter if you wanna open your own store, or you're an employee at a grocery store, or you work for uh, a union, you need to know what your value is. You need to know what you are worth. And if you're worth something that's important to the company, you have to not be afraid to say that. 
You have to not be afraid to ask for whether it's a raise you want, vacation, some kind of new uh, promotion, uh, any kind of enhancement. You always have to know what you're worth and what you are, uh, should be able to ask for. And sometimes you go big, sometimes you, you stay you know, at the level you, you feel comfortable at, but never put yourself in a place where you are undermined and where you don't get what your value is. And I know that's difficult to say to people who are family men and they, maybe their income is for the entire family, but you have to trust me on this. More often than not, when you can, not confront, but when you tell somebody, look, this is what I provide, this is what I'm worth, this is what I'm asking, when they understand the confidence level you have and that you're not afraid to take your business elsewhere or take your platform elsewhere, they'll go for it. You know, that's, that's part of this because yes, there are other people that can do your job, but can they do it as well as you? And are they available at the times you're available? And will they bend over backwards to prove themselves to you once you've purchased their, their, their product or IP or whatever it is? So you kind of use that not only in your businesses, but also in your life. You know, everyone is making a sale at all times of day. I've been saying this since I was a little kid. <laughs> you know, if you're on a date, you're making, or you're trying to get a date, either you're, con you know, convincing the individual why you, you should go on a date, or they're telling you uh, some kind of excuse why they can't. You know, if you want a job, you're convincing the person why you should have that job, or they're telling you why they don't have room for you. If you want to open your own store, you're convincing the bank or the people who invest in you or yourself why you are worth this investment and why you will be successful or they're telling you a thousand reasons why it will fail. And that's the reality of this. You also have to be, and I mentioned being humbled as a New York City actor, in this business especially, you also have to be aware it has a high failure ratio. Now, I want to state the high failure ratio has many different reasons why. Inexperience, uh, people that just can't hack it, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's tough. It's very tough. Or, or people that um, they don't understand what their customers want and they don't know the way to give it to them. Or, and this happens too, they're too generous. Sometimes people will complain, oh, this is too expensive. I can buy this online here, 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 here. Like I mentioned about the boxes. Sure, when I sell these at 125 and I buy these around 100, that's a $25 profit I'm making. No doubt about it, that $25 profit that I make keeps the lights on, that $25 profit I make keeps this place open, pays my bills so I can continue to run this place so people can play here. So I'm not afraid to keep this at this price because I know intrinsically there's a value to the service that I'm providing here. And if I turned off shop right now and went to back to driving Uber, this is 10 to 40 people that come here weekly, uh, and it really does vary like that that would have no place to play, or they would have to find some other place out of the way, less convenient, not as much fun, make your list of ideas that can't play here any longer because I had to close up shop. So this all leads to what I was saying. When you run your own game store, when you run your own business, you need to know what your value is, you need to know what the ask is, and you have to not be afraid to ask for it. Yes, you can buy these boxes cheaper in a lot of places directly. No, you can't play when I close this shop down here any longer. You know, and that's where I think a lot of LGSs also fail is they have cards and yes, they, they have a profit margin built in. But what they forget to say is when I close, where are you going to go? Where are you going to play? Sure, your kitchen table is great, but are your 18 friends going to join you there? Are you going to get to trade every week with those people? Are you going to get to run your F&Ms at your kitchen table? Some people, yes. Most people, no. So... I guess that's really the conversation I wanted to have with you. Running your own business, running your own life, running an LGS, they're difficult, they're hard. But if you believe in yourself, you study the patterns, you know where you want to go with it. And believe me, the patterns are good. The cafe model is a good model. And there's lots of them opening up all over because it's a good model. It's kind of how sports bars were in the 90s. Board game cafes are in the, in the 2020s, if you will. I really feel a lot of people are going to that trend, especially millennials and the generation underneath that. So it's a good hot business to be in if you have the capital, if you're able to do it. But you have to be aware of the sacrifices you're going to make. You know, even when I try to take Mondays off, I'm still doing work relations. Most of it's on my phone. I'm making purchase orders. I'm buying stuff. I'm selling stuff. I'm putting some marketing campaigns together. So I rarely have a minute off. That's the, the downside of running your own business is that it's a lot of work. 
there's no clocking out at five o'clock and calling it a day. You know, when people want to play here till three in the morning, I often let them play here till three in the morning. Um, when there's stuff going on, I, I bend over backwards to try to make this a place where everyone can come and it's a very inclusive place, but you have to give up something to get that. And you also have to establish trust in your community. I have made many strides to say I have no tolerance for forged cards, which are fakes, proxy alters, whatever. Not proxies like, hey, I'm using a proxy in my deck. That's fine. But when you pass off a fake as a real card and you try to make money off that, that's a huge problem. I've had four of those get sent to me through eBay. I've, I've punched holes in each of them. I've, t I've done videos on this. And I've gone through and gotten various... Um, uh, magnifying glasses and 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 uh, scales and ways to detect fakes so people actually come to me to authenticate their cards so you have to be aware that frauds frauds are a real thing in this format especially in this game um, and you have to put yourself out there if you want to be seen as a reputable distributor uh, as a place that you will have zero tolerance for that anyway um that was kind of my thoughts on an LGS basically summarize know your worth don't be afraid to ask for the sale and believe in yourself, you know? Study the patterns, realize if you do wanna open LGS or any business, you have to th really plan not just six months out, you've gotta plan the next six years out. You've gotta see the trends, where they're going, and make an, a, a prediction, you know? It is a risk, it is a gamble. Everything in life is, crossing the, the street too slowly is, you know? But if you've ever uh, been excited by the idea of being your own boss, um, there's nothing better than, than being able to do that and have your friends come by and get to play games with you as well. So um, thank you very much for watching this chat. Uh, I don't see any questions. Um, I kind of touched the arena issue. I'll, I'll go over that real quickly. If you have any additional questions before I wrap up, go ahead and ask them. By the way, as I kind of teased, this will be our Friday box cracking. We do these for 20 bucks uh, for six packs. And um, if you need shipping, we'll do it for 25 bucks for six packs. And uh, we'll crack them tomorrow on the channel. Um, the, the, the thought was brought up about Arena. Arena's been very good for Magic, just like a movie would be very good for Magic. Why? In my estimation, because it's bringing people that are in the, uh, the eSport games that are not necessarily into physical cards, bringing you into our world. And when they see it and when they realize there's value in the real, in the real world, if you will, they're slowly moving into that format and they're picking up these boxes and they're learning how to play and they're getting into the casual EDH format and they're doing all this stuff. So they're having a great time with it. And um, I love Arena. I think Arena is great. But remember, it doesn't have the intrinsic value of actual physical cards. You can't replace digital with real. You just can't. It's fun. It's convenient. But nothing replaces having this in your hands. It's, there's something I want to say magical about that. Magic. All right. Uh, I thank you very much, Mike, and everybody else who joined into the conversation. Have a great day. Uh, for those coming over to D&D &D tonight, I'll see you tonight. Take care. Bye-bye.